This episode is sponsored by Thorne, the official supplement partner of CrossFit. Thorne understands how important it is to know what you're putting into your body. With an extensive line of NSF certified for sports products, Thorne's mission is to provide quality supplements that every athlete at every level can trust, as well as truthful information about how nutritional supplements fit into an athlete's lifestyle. Shop the official supplement partner of CrossFit, create an account at thorne.com forward slash the letter U forward slash CrossFit, that is thorne.com forward slash U forward slash CrossFit, and get 25% off supplements from Thorne. Welcome back to the Cross Against Podcast. I am your host, Chase Ingram, and I am with Adrian Bosman, and we are going to talk the nerdiest subject of all, and that is programming theory in relation to the ultimate test of fitness. This is this is probably going to be my favorite thing to do maybe all year until I get to the games, man. So th <laughs> thanks for taking the time. Um, I, I think what is super fun is it's not even going to be about like hinting at events. But really the process, what it is, the big wide scope of that huge lens that funnels down to the ultimate test. But um, I listened to you on Talking Elite Fitness and the hardest part, as you said, was getting a blank canvas. Because for the last mm -hmm. 15 years, nearly working side by side with Dave is you got to have input on basically what he was throwing out there. And now you have something completely empty and uh, talk through that that challenge, just taking that first step for you this year. Oh, boy. Yeah, um, it was definitely confronting to be staring at, you know, blank documentation, blank <laughs> whiteboard, blank everything and say, OK, you're up and it's coming hot off the heels of, uh, you know, a really busy season mm -hmm. and obviously a season that is not without its set of controversies. So it's been. um Difficult, difficult to start. But once that process did start, it, it actually came together relatively well. Mm -hmm. um, and fits and starts. I think like any other creative process, it's not one of those things. And, and this frustrates some people, uh, both internally and externally, <laughs> I think, is, um, you know, people look at it and they're like, well, why don't you just block out, you know, eight hours for the next week and just do it? Mm, and yeah. you say, OK, that seems reasonable. But like any other creative endeavor, sometimes the juice is there and sometimes it is not. And if you're trying to force it, number one, it's not going to be good. So why bother anyway? Mm -hmm. And number two, you're just going to be frustrating yourself and then putting yourself in a, in a mind state where you don't want to sit down and do the work when you are inspired. So anyway, there's a little bit of give and take there and you have to have a little mm -hmm. bit of grace, uh, you know, yeah. with with yourself to be able to do that. Um, and so there was a bit of a steep learning curve there for me, but once I got rolling, there was uh, it was good. And so like for me, I start with the big picture, like large concepts that I like. There's no sitting there writing workouts and then trying to see how those workouts fit. Mm. That's not at all the case. Okay. I go the other way and I start with, okay, these are the concepts that need to be there. I don't know how they're going to be there yet, I don't know where they're going to fit across the course of the competition, but it's clear to me that these are concepts that we need to include this year. Okay. And then it's a layer down from that. Okay. Well, how do these pair? Do they pair? Should they be independent elements? Um, and then from there, it's a layer down. Okay. Can I start crafting a workout around this? And then, okay, from there, how does this fit within the week? I like so that. it's, it's very much like a big picture type of thing. That gets whittled down and whittled down and whittled down. It's like making an ice sculpture, Chase, <laughs> with a chainsaw. Because <laughs> that's totally easy to do. And it's my I Canadian love roots way. coming through. <laughs> there it is. I love the way you describe that because a lot of times people's like, "Hey, just like you said, just sit in a room and and, and write some workouts." And yeah, I liken programming to any artistic skill, whether it be writing a song and you know playing an instrument. Uh, doing a painting is that there is, I think, a huge element of artistry when it comes to that. And so when we say blank canvas, Candy, like, yeah, yeah it, it, we're not trying to be like metaphorical and, and, and for that sake, but I really truly believe that's part of it. And so, you know, you wouldn't lock someone in a room and like, Hey, paint me a masterpiece in eight hours. How hard can it be? It's like there, yeah. there yeah. is a huge process when it comes to that And inspiration comes in a lot of different ways. And you know, your, your background and, and your, your training background, your coaching background, your athletic background. I mean, we we're talking about like San Francisco CrossFit days 
<laughs> oh yeah, Back in California it's seminar staff like you're deeply rooted in the methodology. And then was it since 2008? Was, yep. really, was that your first year uh, like working with the games and whether it being judging, then judging and being accountable for all of that, creating standards sides to or side by side with Dave and the testing and then having influence and back and forth as a sounding board over the last 15 years is that I think you have a very unique background and tool set when it comes to what you can bring to the table this year to the CrossFit Games. Well, thanks. How much, I, um, how I much that that's the case. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I believe it is. I believe it is. But how much do you use or lean on those experiences to influence and maybe guide how you program for the CrossFit Games? Oh, hugely. I mean, I think it's impossible not to, um, you know, draw from your background, especially for me personally, because I've been so involved in CrossFit for so long. Uh, you know, I'd like to think I have a pretty good uh, hand on the pulse of not only what it is in the modern era, but where it's come from and and the underpinnings uh, around it. And that's from a philosophy, at which I really do believe, you know, Greg Glassman's original thrust was a philosophical one and one that was really intent on cutting away the bloat and the the chaff that had um, pervaded the fitness industry. And, and I think that in a lot of ways that is certainly creeping back in, in the modern era, you know, everybody's got so much access to information. It's funny. It's like, I, I look at some of these Instagram influencers and, and different uh, outlets online that are starting to gain traction. And I'm like, you guys are basically moving us back towards the Nautilus movement of the 60s. <laughs> this is this is nothing new. This is just a return back to a cycle that has already come and gone. Um, and so I really do think that that philosophy of CrossFit is just as uh, necessary today, even though it is more widespread. And even though if you look at it and you're immersed in it, it can seem mainstream. Um, anyway, all that to say, as far as programming, programming the games, it's, it's really important to me that the method of cross CrossFit is at the forefront and what we do is mixed modalities. What we do is find people who are objectively the fittest. Uh, what we do is focus on the things that move the needle. What we do is expand and challenge athletes to take on things that maybe they aren't as comfortable or familiar with and ultimately expand their fitness that way. Um, and so all of these things have to be reflected in the games. Uh, and, you know, for the athletes, that that's something that I think they expect. Uh, what I also want for the fans and for people that are watching around the world is that they have something they can rally behind, they can be inspired by it. And maybe not in the sense that they want to be a CrossFit Games athlete. I know I certainly... I'm one of those people that I'm a huge fan, but I have no aspirations to compete, uh, you know, in a CrossFit competition. That's just not really my cup of tea. But I do walk away from seeing some of these competitions with like, wow, man, I can really take my own fitness a little bit further than I thought. Mm. I think I can be a little bit more disciplined. I think I can do a little more than I was previously. And I think that is one of the most important aspects of the games outside of, hey, we, we have a big test to conduct for the best. That's that's kind of the bedrock. However, uh, there's also this huge factor where we've got to create something that inspires the community to take their training for the next year and the next season and get stoked and get to work. So you, you touched on two points in that, and that was actually going to be my next question, is that this comes up a lot when you look at, say, general programming, say, for an affiliate or the community at large, in that there's this big barrier. We, well, not even a barrier. I actually don't think it's a barrier at all, more of an application, is that you look at training versus testing. Yeah. And so when you look at your everyday affiliate, it's like you have the, you know, you have the workout of the day, whether it's six to seven days a week or like dot com where it's three on one off and just that repeats that cycle. And then you have what is a testing phase or, you know, benchmark workouts like those are one rep maxes, three rep maxes. All of those things are little benchmarks to see where your training has come to be. Mm -hmm. How do you look at, say, the balance you have in, say, a training program to a balance you have in what is the ultimate test of fitness come August? 
Um, you know, it's interesting because I don't think necessarily that uh, there's this huge delineation between the two. I understand the argument that there are training and testing and they are different. I get that. But I think the Venn diagram does have a lot of overlap between the two. Um, and I think that's part of the fun of CrossFit, right? Like every day you're in the gym, there is a clock going. There is a record of what you're doing. You are going to come back and reference that to some degree, even if it's not exactly the same workout. So I, I don't think there's this huge hard line between the two. Um, what, can you rephrase that question? Like what, what, what's the... Uh... Uh, really, that's actually the direction I was, was taking you is that there is this conception that there's two different worlds. And really, yeah, yeah. I feel like it's more just an application as far as when you, when you say big picture, I want these concepts. And I see stimulus when you say things like that. And I think a balanced program should not be dissimilar from a balanced test and feel like it's one of the same. It's more of just the application of, of the purpose of the workout or series of workouts or events that you have at the CrossFit Games. Yeah, again, I think there's there's a lot of overlap. You know, if you're trying to create people that are fit, you're going to have to have a pretty broad program. And if you're going to test the fittest, then obviously you're going to have to have a pretty broad test. Otherwise, you're just testing specialty. So in that regard, yes, there is a lot of overlap. Um, I do think that where the distinction starts to become a little bit more noticeable is what are you going to do in practice to try to push the needle forward versus what am I going to do on the floor where I completely uncork it and see what I'm capable of. And so, like you said, that is a bit of an application difference, even if maybe what you're doing on paper looks similar. Um, you know, so for example, I, I come back to something simple all the time, the one mile run. If you're training to run the one mile uh, in a competition, it's unlikely that you're just going to show up and run a mile a couple times a week and call it good and then hope for the best when the track meet starts. That's <laughs> not a really great approach. And any running coach is going to look at that and be like, well, it's not only lazy, it's probably not going to be that effective. And, and the same can be kind of extrapolated for broader fitness. Um, you know, there's certain things that are totally valid tests that one mile run is a great test, but if that's all your training revolves around, you're missing the boat a little bit. Um, however, that doesn't mean that when it comes to test day, that it it takes anything away from the simplicity and the and the greatness of that test. And so, I think that's um, kind of the mindset that I, I go into things with um, is that you know these these are not meant to be workouts. Um, they, you certainly are working out, I guess, if you're looking <laughs> at, the, right. at the effort that's being put forward, but. The goal here is not to leave that competition floor pushing the needle forward with your fitness, although physiologically that may be impossible to avoid. Um, what is supposed to happen is that you're supposed to take what you've been training all year and see what you can do with what's put in front of you. So slightly different, even though, like I said, I think that the overlap is much greater than a lot of people try to paint it sometimes. Um, but yeah, it is, it is important to kind of understand both of those worlds. When you talk about a balance test and a balanced program, I think that's where that overlap is. Is like just because we, I mean, we talk about this at level one, it's like variance by degree, not by kind. It's all still the same stuff, just different degrees at which athletes can tackle them, whether you're doing ring muscle ups or ring mm -hmm. rows. The intent is really still the same. And so when you look at a balanced test, say at the games and, you know, over the years, the test number has varied between 10 to 15 um, events across the span of three to four days. And I think that can also change the way you really design some events, more events, you have the opportunity to do a couple more niche things possibly where less is maybe there needs to be more balance within the event itself. When you think of a balanced test, what are a few of the, you said basically genres or categories you mm -hmm. look at for balance, whether it's time domains, stimulus of the event itself, whether it's short, long or, or moderate, even movement patterns. What, what big, yeah. basically, like you said, Venn diagram circles, do you look at to have balance within them? Well, I mean, I'll give the, uh, the plug to the level one. Uh, I mean, of course I love that course. I spent years and years and years teaching it. I think it's the greatest thing that somebody could do to empower themselves to lead a healthy, happy life. Um, it's like the user manual for, for the human body. You know, like It's very yeah. simple to take that information and apply it and have um, great outcomes for years and years. 
Uh, and you don't have to be an expert. And I, I love everything about that. So big plug for the level one. If you haven't gone out and done that, do it. It's the best. Um, and within that, they have a very simple approach to programming. It's a basic kind of theoretical model. And in that, uh, it explains the different domains of training. So you've got basic gymnastics movements, basic weightlifting movements, and then monostructural movements. And so if you think about those simply, you just you basically have controlling your body unloaded, controlling an external object, and then cyclical repeated efforts. That's the monostructural or, you know, a lot of people will think about that as traditional kind of cardio. Mm -hmm. So you need a good blend of those three elements. Um, you need to express them on their own. You need to express them in, in combination. So that's one domain to start looking at the programming through. Uh, the second, obviously, like you said, is time frame. Um, you need a huge range. You have to prove that these athletes are capable not only at the short end of things, like an all-out sprint, but that they have the endurance to sustain effort for long periods of time and maybe in ways that um, they couldn't have trained for specifically. That's that's mm -hmm. a big thing across the board. Um, and to me, this kind of harkens to what I thought was such an impressive feat last year that I can't believe people just don't bring it up all the time. And maybe they do, and I'm just not listening. But you know, when Tia Claire on the first day of competition last season, she won the, the hour plus event, yes. our sustained effort. And then she wins the shortest event of the weekend, the 550 yard sprint. Yeah. It's a minute and change. Yeah. And then she wins a little bit later in the competition, the heaviest lift event, the one rep max snatch. I mean, you open the physiology textbook and it, it tells you that that should not be the case. You should not have the same athlete that wins <laughs> the endurance event, win the sprint event, and then win the lifting event. That's not the way it's supposed to happen, but there she is doing it. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that's so cool, number one. And number two, I don't know how anybody could look at that even externally and say, all right, with these combination of abilities, I believe there's somebody fitter. It's like, how, how? <laughs> Show it to me. I don't, I don't understand how that could happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm open to the argument if you can provide one, but I just don't see it. And so I'm rambling a little bit, getting off track. But yeah, so domain number one, we've got those uh, different modes of exercise. Number mm -hmm. two, we've got time frames. Mm -hmm. uh, then I like to look at the distribution of load. Okay. From, you know, no load at all, obviously body weight to one rep max. How are we doing on that kind of spread? Um, repetitions across an effort. Do we have uh, like a low rep uh, type of effort all the way up to high and many, many repetitions? Um, do we have a good spread there? Um, and then you mentioned movement uh, function as well. So basic movement function is another way that I look at it. Um, and so that categorically is pretty simple. It's, you know, okay, do we have a, a squatting movement? Do we have a deadlifting style movement? I know some people like to call those hinging these days if you're <laughs> popular on the internet. Um, upper body pulling versus upper body pushing, trunk flexion, mm. you know, other. Do we have a good spread across those? And then my approach is I'll look at each one of those lenses, put it on paper, look at it day by day, across the competition and then total it up and see what have we covered in totality. And, you know, once you have a pretty good sense of what you want to do and you've mapped it out in that way, you notice some things that you have to go back and change because they don't fit or because oh, okay. there's too much overlap or because you didn't get something that needed to be addressed. Uh, there's a glaring hole, et cetera. And so, um, that's where I think the rubber meets the road. You know, there's certainly a creative process like we talked about. There's certainly plenty of room to kind of have these uh, showcase pieces. You know, it's a big stage, all of that. But it's got to be rooted in some objectivity of, all right, we actually do have our bases covered. We have done the homework. And, um, yeah, the spread is there. When you have that all laid out, <clears throat> we always look back to not trying to reinvent the wheel per se. And cross it's a perfect example. It's like we didn't invent push-ups and pull-ups and deadlifts. We just found That's a better way. To, <laughs> That's right. What are you talking about? It, we found a better way to <laughs> apply that. Whether it's to uh, fitness or testing your fitness. Uh, another one that um, I'm curious of is that you know we get to the games and the games is where you see something unique every once in a while. If not there's oh, yeah. that one thing every year. But at the same time, you still want to have a classic sense of who we are, how we came to yep. be, 
and you want to test that while maybe tipping your cap to the methodology and what, you know, the classic nature that is CrossFit itself. Do you look at when you have it all laid out, you says, okay, we can afford to do something a bit more nuanced here while still balancing out with say something a bit more classic on the other side. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So that's kind of what I think about is maybe not icing on the cake, but that's once I've gone through the process, like I just described, you have all these different lenses to look at the program in totality and you say, okay, we do have the spread we need. We do have, um, the, the movements roughly that we want, you know, the reps are there, the loads are there, that sort of thing. Then the question is, all right, let's pull back out to 20,000 foot view. Is this classic enough? Is there enough there that's recognizable, um, to people that are fans of the sport, to, to athletes that are training for it? Is there anything that's obviously out of left field that is just there because it's a pet project or a pet idea? Yeah. Uh, does it actually serve the test? Um, and sometimes the answer is yes. There's something there that is really cool. It's worth doing and it's outside the box a little bit. And sometimes the answer is no. You look at it and you say, oh, okay, this was a great idea. But if I'm honest about it, it doesn't really fit. We should probably shelve this and put it on the drawing board for later. Mm -hmm. and see if we can integrate it in a better way later. Uh, and so both of those things happen. There's no question about it. When you look at a, another balance form, and you know, we always talk is like, we're never looking at a specific athlete or whoever qualified, but yeah, I think yeah. there is something to say, and it just depends on this type of workout that it is. When you look at creating events for the games, athlete maybe type or size. It's like the way an athlete say like, five foot four or lower is going to be much different experience maybe than someone who's six foot four or or taller do you look at the movements at all and maybe how it could be balanced maybe across a type of athlete as far as like maybe size not necessarily skill set i think the best way to answer that is broadly but not specifically okay. um i think it's a chicken and egg question uh, mm -hmm. If you are looking at it through the lens of like, well, different body types are going to be favored by different movements and therefore it should be a primary consideration when you're programming, I think you're missing the boat because a large part of what we do and a large part getting back to the philosophy of CrossFit is what can you do? And what can you do does not come down to what can you do because of your particular phenotype you know, or yeah. body type or whatever. It's can you get this thing from A to B? Can you pick this thing up and put it over your head? Can you manage your own body through this series of challenges? And the answer is binary. It is a yes or no question. And so through that process, there is going to be a body type that emerges, like there is in all sports, that favors the breadth of that test. That's just a fact. You know, you yeah. have any sport that is played for, um, you know, a long time and, uh, people start to really get interested in that sport, you notice that there is a particular body type. And, and I think um, football is an interesting example, American football, because you have so many different positions and the body types range so specifically for those positions. <laughs> yes. Nobody says, oh, it's really unfair that the linebacker has to be this humongous refrigerator of a human being. I think I would really advocate that the linebacker is now a 135 pound guy. You're like, well, it's just not appropriate for that, <laughs> for that thing. Right. And likewise, you know, no uh, disrespect to the very tall or the very short within CrossFit, but like, yeah, there's going to be certain things that are going to be a disadvantage. That is just the nature of the sport. And because we're looking for the broadest, most well-rounded individual, there's going to be a body type that, that kind of reflects that. And that's the way it is. So no, I don't think it's uh, appropriate to start looking too deeply at that. I do think it's appropriate to look at that in the sense that, okay, we have this series of workouts. Do all of them favor uh, yes. a particular body type? Are all of these quote, big guy workouts or little guy workouts or whatever? If that's the case, then you got a problem for sure. But if you're looking at every movement through that lens and every workout through that lens or every test through that lens, I, I think you're not approaching it um, with the right level uh, of, of focus. I, and I think it's, you know, we said it's like life doesn't have weight classes. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and neither does CrossFit. And that's, that's the whole point. But I, I do and, love. Well, and I'll, I'll say too, that I think that there are, it, I think it's fun to play around with concepts like that. Mm -hmm. I think that there, you know, at some point in the future, there may be a 
a place for that, like an off season exhibition competition or whatever, where you have like a, you know, less than 200 pound class and a greater than 200 pound class, you know, like, like the strong man kind of basic delineation, stuff like that. I don't think it has a place at the games. There's difference uh, right there. So, you know, yeah. Could that be fun to, to find the, the fittest, <laughs> you know, five, seven, 165 pounder sure uh it, does that have a place at the games uh, welterweight class i i, I don't exactly. have my boxing yeah. classes or, or yep. wrestling uh weight classes up to par yep. but I, I love what you said there as far as the explanation to start and then how you close it out is like yes if we all look at this as like okay this favors them then yes maybe we need to go back to the drawing board and see you know where we got in a rut but as far as yeah, isolating yeah. that as a driving force of the programming it's no different than skill sets between athletes like oh well, you're Absolutely. gonna have strong yeah. people yeah. and weak people and endurance yep. and yep. not and like the best fittest most balanced individual regardless of height weight skills strength endurance shouldn't matter at the end of the day if yeah. the yeah. test has hit all, checked all the boxes like you wanted to Absolutely. And it kind of a, another throwback here, you know, if you go back and read some of the early journal articles, this is one of the things that Greg Glassman predicted he had. And I can't remember which article off the cuff, but it was one of the early, probably pre 2005 journal articles where he said the prototypical CrossFit athlete for men is going to be somebody who's around, you know, 510 to six feet tall, 185 pounds to 200 pounds. They're going to be, you know, Wow. By all accounts, not uh, not necessarily average because these guys are not average in any way. But <laughs> but as far as body type, they're not going to be mass monsters and they're not going to be svelte little endurance athletes. They're going to be somewhere in the middle. And I think he nailed that because, yes, yes in order to have the wow. range of capacities, that's what is going to be kind of the um, body type that's that that is going to gravitate towards it. Um, and, and that makes perfect sense to me. It's again, it's not that that is what is the goal, but that is certainly what you start to see emerging. Um, and that doesn't mean, you know, people will listen to this and I think they'll say, oh, that means a tall guy could never win. It's like, no, they just have to be really good in some ways that a short guy might have to be good in other ways. That's just the way it is. Oh, totally. I mean, you look at say what Brent Fikowski can do at the CrossFit games, Absolutely. like it's, it's a product of everything that he's put into, but on the yep. flip side, throw back to Chris Spieler. The, the thing that he had to overcome to make podiums or to be in the top yep. five or top 10 every year. Or how about Chris and Clever? Oh, I well, mean, we, we got a champ. Right. One of the greatest, actually, end end performances yeah. at the games ever, if you look at average finish place, which he did yeah, in 2008. Exactly. One, one of my favorite athletes was uh, Chris Clever. And, you know, she, if you were to look at Chris and size her up and say, oh yeah, this is the body type. That's the prototypical CrossFit athlete. You, no, nobody's going to come to that conclusion. She's, <laughs> she's a lot smaller than most, especially a lot of the modern, um, female yes. competitors. And certainly at the time she was on the smaller end and, and yeah, didn't bother off. She goes, she wins it and see y'all next year. So yeah, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, when you look at say, okay, so now we're looking at the games, you have a that number of events that you're comfortable with as far as being a breadth of balance test we do well over the years the cuts have changed over the years in the early yeah. days um people forget there have been cuts like prior to even 2000 i want to say 11 and 12 when they stopped doing them for a couple of years and then there was a there was a huge cut in 2009 that was a giant mercy kill because that year was so brutal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was cut in 2010. So I know, <laughs> See, all, there you about, go. <laughs> I know all about this. Like, were you at the games? I'm like, depends on what a number of events qualify as being at the games. I'm pretty sure James Hobart got cut uh, from the <laughs> first day of 2009 games. Pat Sherwood as well. <laughs> I'm pretty uh, sure. And <laughs> but when you look at that, and so there's, a, and then there's some as aggressive as say 2019. Yeah. When you look at, say, a cut schedule or a set number of cuts, in my opinion, every time you make a cut, I think you should be able to look back at the tests that were given and you can appropriately say is like, okay, if we're cutting from 40 to 30, these 30 have been appropriately tested to make the top yeah. 30. And the next series of events, you cut to 20. And I think there needs to be an appropriate balance so you can at least be like, have we found the fittest with this test? No. But have we found the fittest 30 mm -hmm. or 20 or 10? Yes. For this year, do you have a cut schedule? And then how does that influence the way you order your programming for the weekend? 
Great question. So I'll start with the age group and adaptive because they're kind of easiest in this conversation. Um, you know, adaptive, obviously they're the newest divisions. Uh, this is their second season with us. And so no cuts for them. Um, you know, they had a, a slightly expanded season from 2021 where they had the, uh, uh, online second competition in May. Was it June? May, end of May. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at my calendar right now. It's in that semifinals kind of uh, shoulder season between yeah. May and June. The May June but, window. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, but uh, at any rate, they, um, the top five from three divisions are going to be in Madison. And so no cuts for them. Uh, age groupers, same deal. They had a, a third stage of competition this season, which is new to them, their semifinals. And in that semifinals, uh, you know, we cut to the top 10 to make it to the game. So this is a smaller field than we're accustomed to um, for the age group categories. So no cuts for them when they're in Madison. We've already whittled the field enough. (laughs) And um, that leaves us with individuals and teams. So on the individual side of the house, we are making one cut. And it's going to be Saturday night after all of the events have concluded Saturday And we're going to cut to the top 30. So pretty tame in the scheme of things. Yep. So So, taking 30 into the final day of competition. That's correct. So top 30 men and women advance to Sunday. Teams uh, follow exactly the same cut schedule, but the number's a little bit different. Okay. Um, So Saturday after competition, they'll be cut as well. And we're going to cut the field in half. It'll be 20 teams advance to Sunday. Got it. Got it. That's awesome. Yeah. And time to play <laughs> absolutely and and so that was a big consideration obviously is like hey if you're going to make cuts they have to be done in a way that it makes sense for the people that are remaining that they're clearly the ones that should be moving forward and like you said they have to be well-rounded enough that you know if you if you don't make that cut somehow your best hand is yet to be played so to speak that that would be not so great mm-hmm. um so that was one consideration, but uh, to be perfectly frank, I went into programming this year's games with the mindset that there were not going to be cuts. Okay. My wow. initial conception was I'm going to try to craft the competition in a way that we can have everybody play at all stages. And that was the operating model for a long time. And then once we started getting really into the weeds with schedule, once we started getting into the weeds of like, okay, here's all the tests that we want to do. And they're kind of non-negotiable. And then you start to be faced with this decision between, do we start cutting tests or do we change these tests and kind of nerf them so that we can get more people through them? Or do we take a hard look at it and say, you know what, not everybody gets to play because we don't want to change the integrity of what we're doing. And that was an easy decision at that point. It's like, hey, you know what, through Saturday, there are so many opportunities to show that you need to be in that top realm, that if you're not there, I don't think there's any excuse. Um, And it wasn't worth it to us to start changing things about the tests that we want to do to accommodate um, more and more heats going through them. I like that. Another thing people forget is that there's been cuts since back, what, 2009, but the, the test has evolved so much. Like 2007 was three events. Yep. When I look at 2007, though, and I would love your opinion on this, is when you look at, say, you know, Glassman defined what fitness was in 2002. Dave has been trying to pioneer what that should look like as a test over the last 15 years. But you look back at 2007, you have the CrossFit total, a 5K ish trail run around the ranch, and then you have a hopper event that r- literally was basically the precipice for a model we use in a what is fitness lecture. And when you just bring it down to simple elegance, as Pat Sherwood would allude to, 2007 was a wonderful test. I agree. I, I think it was very pure. And that is something that's always interesting to me. Um, you know, there's this balance of you have people that are going to come in. They expect a big show. It is a big show. The athletes are training in a way right now that reflects a lot of volume. Um, it reflects, you know, the knowledge that they're going to be tested multiple times a day. Um, but that being said, I don't think that should be kind of an arms race where it just keeps going and going and going. I don't think that's appropriate nor necessary. And I do think that it's a very interesting question uh, to pose that is, hey, what can you continue to strip away and Mm -hmm. still have the same core test and the same um, confidence in the outcome? Uh, I don't know that answer. I don't know that there is a static answer to that, but I do think it's a great framing 
to start to look at some of these things that we're doing. And, and, um, I go back to the last chance qualifier this season. I was really happy with the way that that played out. And I liked the series of workouts, you know, I'm, I'm biased. I, I came <laughs> up with them. So, you know, but, but at the end of the day, it was four tests. Um, you know, it was a very short competition, but I do think that the ground that was covered within that shows that you don't need a 16 stage competition to really have people emerge that are clearly deserving um, of that next step. And I, I do think the same can be said for the games to some degree. Now, does that mean there's only going to be six events at this year's games? Absolutely not. <laughs> but I looked at the schedule and like, well, then we're missing half these time frames. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it is a good question. And I think it adds a nice bit of balance to the entire process because at a certain point, you have to say, okay, what's enough? Mm -hmm. And um, what can we start stripping away without losing anything? And, comma, should we start stripping away? Um, because there is a point where you're going to lose too much. So, and anyway, and that alludes to the fact is like we look back at 2007 when we when we are almost nostalgic about the simplicity yet like purity of the test in 2007. But I also look at it with the caliber of athletes that were taking that test at the time. I sure. probably wouldn't have the same feeling with this field of athletes. The sport has evolved. The athletes have evolved and the test has to evolve with that. And for you, this is a little bit of a chicken and egg question, but there's always this bar to be raised, whether it's, okay, here's the field. We're going to raise the bar here and see if they can advance the next year or the athletes do it for you. How have you noticed that yeah. change over the year between the test evolving the athletes or the athletes evolving the test? Um, I think it's symbiotic. I think I think that there are certainly things that surprise us uh, every year, and I'm certainly surprised by some things that athletes are so good at that it's a little bit beyond the um, expected outcome. On the other hand, there is definitely a kind of monkey see, monkey do approach to a lot of people's training. And so mm. I think there's a lot of people that are influenced by what they think the competition is supposed to be. And then they train for that thing. And sometimes that doesn't end up the way that they want it to. <laughs> and I'm perfectly comfortable with that. Um, and I think that if that's frustrating to you as an athlete, you know, maybe the sport isn't for you. I, and I, I don't mean that to discourage anybody, but I do think that it's important people understand what they're getting into. And what we are doing is trying to push those boundaries. And we will always be trying to push those boundaries to some degree. Um, and yeah, it is symbiotic, right? Like there are going to be things that come back and you're like, wow, I cannot believe, I, I, you know, strength numbers, I think is something that is um, an obvious one where you're like, geez, these mm -hmm. guys are just, they continue to push that so far uh, beyond what I think we would have expected five, 10 years ago. And the, the loads that can be lifted under fatigue in the middle of a, a, a more grueling test continue to be beyond expectation, in my opinion. Um, however, there are some other areas that I think people have gotten lazy is maybe too strong of a word, but they've got a little bit complacent. comfortable. Yeah, yeah okay. sure. Complacent. Yeah. yeah. They, they've gotten a little bit comfortable as far as the way they approach certain things because they're like, well, this is just the way it shows up in competition most of the time. And I'm not really going to push the boundaries there because of that. And I, I don't have time for that. So <laughs> <laughs> putting my foot down. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you can, you can take that and interpret that for what it is, oh, but um, you know, athletes and their coaches owe it to themselves to look at things, not just as how they have been done, Mm -hmm. but where they could lead to. And that I think is really the mark of a great coach and a great athlete is to have that vision to say, okay, this is the base skill, but where does it go from here? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and apply that broadly. Um, that's a big, important thing. And, and you've seen this since the, uh, the beginning, like it was such a shock in 2008 when everybody was asked to do chest to bar Fran and people were like, Oh my <laughs> goodness, I didn't know that a chest to bar pull up was going to be so important. And there was a core contingency of us that were like, what do you mean? Like you don't train chest to bar. I mean, I'm not claiming that I would have been better than those athletes certainly was not, not nor am I now on that level of fitness, but it was no surprise that like, yeah, a chest to bar pull up should be something that you do. You should do them strict. You should do them kipping. You should, you know, all of these things, you should do them weighted, whatever. If that's a shock to you, I'm a little surprised. I, I thought the same thing when they put dumbbells in the open. 
Exactly. Like, That's what? another great like, example. Yeah. Do yeah. you not listen to what like yeah. Greg yeah. has been talking about? Is like he almost put more of an emphasis on that than he did barbell mm -hmm. work. It's like why? How? How do you not have dumbbells in your yeah. in yeah. your gym? And it's funny because you do see the little bit of tension um, emerge, and I think it, it's unavoidable. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but. You know, athletes are going to look for every edge that they can get. They should. That's that's part of the game is they want to be competitive. And so sometimes that means, all right, I know certain things are probably going to show up in certain ways. I'm going to train them that way and get really good at that thing. Barbell cycling is a great example, right? Like everybody who's a competitor these days can cycle a barbell like crazy. Wow, it's unreal. awesome. That's great. You know, however, if that's the only way that you're approaching your barbell training, you've made a mistake because that is not the only application of that thing. And it's certainly not the best and only way to use that tool. And that's what you have to not lose sight of as a competitor or just the average CrossFit athlete, in my opinion, you can't get so in love with this one method, uh, that you lose sight of the rest of the way that this thing can be utilized. We look at the tests over the years. This goes along exactly what you're talking about is that we've seen either a unique format that is basically popped up for the first time or unique movement or piece of equipment that seems to be a theme over the years barring say maybe 2019 i think we didn't have a new piece of equipment but do you we're, have we're gonna have all three this year <laughs> okay that was the, this is the best answer i could have hoped for is like do we have something that's coming up in august that is unique to yes. the test and maybe something that these athletes have never put their hands on before? yeah so there'll be there'll be a couple of well yeah, a couple of unique elements. And um, you know what I think is fun about the unique elements is that they're not so far out that everybody's going to be like, oh, my God. You know, I mean, <laughs> they will to some degree, but it's not going to be like, like, oh, wow, I could never in a million years have seen something like this coming. No, they could have seen it coming. And, um, you know, uh, certainly there will be some that have been doing some of these things mm. at least some of the time, uh, okay. maybe just not with as much emphasis as they thought. But yeah, there's a few things uh, that are unique as far as equipment. There are a few things that are unique as far as format, which I'm really excited about. Um, what was your third category? Oh, uh, equipment movement. And it could be yep. movement yep. with a piece of equipment as well. It's yes, like, okay, there's that yeah, as well. Everybody's yeah. used a dumbbell, but they've never done it with like this or something like yep. that. Yep. Okay. Yes. So yes, I have, I have a, um, to me, it was, I, I keep like, putting puzzle pieces and drawing red line and yarn together. But like, it was like seeing a wall walk in the open. Yeah. It was like, Oh my gosh. I'm like, I have been doing this movement since 2009. <laughs> what, what? It's like, this is dumb. I was like, do you know how hard this is? It's like, you well, want to walk on your hands because it's sexy on Instagram. Wall walks are so difficult. When here's the thing that I think is great about that is um, number one. Yeah. No surprise to a lot of people. You're like, okay, that's a, you know, one of those things that people practice fine. Um, but even for those that didn't, and I'm thinking particularly at the top of the heap, the uh, really superstar athletes that are like, oh man, I haven't done a wall walk in a decade because I haven't needed to. Mm -hmm. But turns out that when they need to, it's still there. Their general physical preparation allowed them to still be on the top of the heap. It didn't matter that they had not trained that sp specifically. And I think that is also important to recognize is that, hey, as an athlete, if your training is doing what it's supposed to, this hyper specificity isn't the game. The game is and always will be. How do I get my training to a point that it supports whatever comes up in front of me? And even if that thing is something that I couldn't have done in that way, mm -hmm. can I still overcome it and do it? That's what we're trying to find. And so it's okay sometimes that athletes are like, well, I couldn't have done that specifically. Okay, okay. great. Let's see how you can apply what you have been doing to that because that's really what we're looking for uh, at its heart. And that's the root of it all. General physical yeah. preparedness, also yep. known as classic CrossFit. And that's when Absolutely. I look at, um, when we talked about the LCQ and your events is like, okay, which one is going to be the best predictor of say the top 10? Um, it's always hard to say the top one or top three, but I like looking at the top 10 and lo and behold, it turned out to be event four, the most classic CrossFit event you program on the women's side. It was the same one through 10 as it was in that event. Just oh, in interesting. Different order. I didn't on know that men, on the men's side. It was nine of the 10, 19 wow. of the 20 of the top 10 in that event were the top 10 at the end of the weekend. And that's just 
good old fashioned classic cross it. Like you said, general physical preparedness. Um, I got one more question for you because I know. Yeah. Well, hold on. <laughs> let me, let me. Let okay, me just yeah, interject real quick and then we'll get yeah. to your last question. But I, uh, this is kind of going back a few steps in the conversation, but I think King for a Day, it would be really fun to have the opportunity to take something like the 2007 games and recreate them in the off season with a handful of athletes and uh -huh. even a full field of athletes, you know, take the top 20 men and women, mm -hmm. invite them out, do that series of tests and see how close is it to the outcome of this year's games? Like what, what is oh, that the would tangible be awesome. difference? You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think it'd just be a fun experiment to run. Um, and I don't know that it would necessarily prove anything one way or the other, but it would be really fun to do and really interesting to take a look across and see, all right, what is the difference here? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we had this conversation is what I'm going to do we're going to do an episode on a, a programming podcast is that we want to try to go through every game. So the last 15 years and pick the oh, one man. event that closely predicted the top 10 athletes that year. Yes. And oddly enough, it was the hopper event in 2007. The women were one, two, three, exactly. The men were oh, like wow. two, one, four, something like that. It was, it was wild. So I, I think I have a theory that there's always one event that isn't this event dictates, but there's one that is very close, right? Like LCQ4. Yep, yep. And then I want to see what the threat is. So I like big, big deep dive rabbit hole. But like that is definitely something I've been wanting to do for a while now. So, okay. Last I love one. that. I love that concept. And, and I think that there's certainly, I'm looking at, oh man, there's probably three. I know you've hinted at this before. So I'm going to try yeah. to figure it out. While there's I'm three that oh, pop to man. mind immediately okay. that i'm like yeah i think if you are crushing it on that one it's a good chance it's going to reflect the rest of your competition okay. um but i'll wait until we'll have this conversation yeah, we'll after it's all wrapped game. up and, yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll have to write it on a piece of paper with like yeah exactly in an envelope <laughs> <it> up for the <laughs> <laughs> totally podcast but uh, all right this is your first year with the reins to the CrossFit Games itself. Um, I've programmed small events here, but it stresses me out to another level. And you're talking about, yeah. there's a couple of nights where you haven't slept. So question for you before we close things out. Do you have more loss of sleep or more nervous about making an event that is too hard or an event that is too easy? Uh, my knee jerk was to say too easy. You definitely don't want it to be too easy. Um. So that's, oh man, that's a tough question. Hold on one second. <laughs> Sorry, I had to clear my throat there. Um, I yeah, I th I'm going to go with too easy. I think I'm concerned that it's not going to be enough. I I really have to convince myself and go back and look at my analysis to remind myself that yeah, we are doing enough. That yes, there is uh, the breadth that we're looking for, etc. Um, and you know, seeing the athlete experience after doing testing week was really a good confirmation around that. And they're so funny because I mean, they're all studs, but by the end of that week, you know, you go in the morning and everybody's, they, they look fatigued, <laughs> but to a person, you ask every one of them, how are you feeling? They're like, oh, I feel good. Yeah, of course you do. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> but when it came time to do some of those final events, it's like, oh, you guys are moving a little slower mm -hmm. than you were uh, a couple of days ago. You guys are a little less, uh, <laughs> enthusiastic in your warm-ups you know we went from a 45 minute warm-up to like a couple of arm circles and now let's just get this over with um so there's 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 tells there and and that's heartening to me because it's like okay this is enough yeah especially in the modern day when all of these athletes train not all of them but so many of them train with such high volume mm -hmm. um you know you have to make sure that that it is enough yeah well i think they're really, I'm not, not to speak for you. Is like, there's never been an issue in my head watching the games. Like these tests have been practiced. The demo team has done this 15 times to get it right. And then all of a sudden the yoke event happens and you're like, yeah, son yeah. of a gun. <laughs> You've shaken yeah, all of yeah. the confidence that we made something that was too easy for athletes to do. Did that, uh, does that ever creep back in your head when you're, well, you had the demo team? Out there? Here's my take. Yeah, yeah, to some degree. Um, it, yes, but not maybe in 
the way that you're thinking. I think for that event particularly, there's a couple ways to look at it, right? Like, let's go back to the one mile run example. If mm. you look at the one mile run and you say, huh, I wonder how fast this can be run. Uh, that's a great lens to look at it. If you look at the one mile run and you say, nobody's going to beat five minutes. Right. You're going to have a, a rude awakening when people are going sub four. You're like, oh, wow, <laughs> that's not what we expected. And, and that yeah. doesn't mean that the test was any better or worse. It was just that mm -hmm. your expectations didn't reflect the reality. That's all. And I so like that's that. what I think we saw with that um, yoke event last year. I personally didn't have a real problem with the fact that, you know, there were some athletes that quote, beat the test. Good for them. Right. That's awesome. It, it did not, that was not an expectation that we had based on the testing that we had done. And we had tested that one a lot. And the fact that they did it better than what we expected, I don't think detracted from the test. It just was a testament to the athletes and how great they were. So good for them. Um, that, in my opinion, that was not a negative. That was an exciting, compelling thing that came out and was kind of a fun story. Um, you know, so be it. And so that, I think that's a really healthy way to look at a lot of this stuff is that, you know, you have your expectations around the test, but just because the expectations are either, um, greater or lesser than what you expected doesn't mean that the test was necessarily good or bad. It just means that yeah. it was slightly different when it came to play. That's all. I like and that. so same, same thing with a lot of these, it's like, yeah, I know that again, objectively, we have the spread that we need. We are testing the domains that are appropriate to, to crown the fittest. And so if athletes are a little faster or a little slower than what we expected, that's just the race on race day. I, I love that. And, you know, to, to wrap it all in a bow is that, yeah, we spent an hour talking about programming and the ideas behind it. But <clears throat> look, knowing who you are and what your, your real driver is, is that you don't want the story to necessarily be the test. You want it to be well, what the athletes some can do, of that. What the athletes can do with that, right? And so it's yeah, the story. And there's got to be right, yeah, a nice blend of these events and what these athletes could do with it. Versus, and it goes both ways, right? Look what they did with this test, and look what this test did with them. And I think there's that, like you said, a symbiotic relationship between the two, where yeah. you don't want one to overshadow the other. Well, and I mean, you look at it through a couple of different lenses. Um, lens. One is the outsider that's not familiar with CrossFit uh, or they're a casual fan. They need to be able to look at what is laid out for the wow. What they are capable of is truly amazing based on the breadth of their ability. And I don't need a real thing in CrossFit or exercise science or whatever to understand that we have a single athlete that is strong, fast, flexible, has a lot of stamina, has a lot of endurance, is skilled. That should be readily apparent. And so the test does have to tell that story. However, I don't think the test needs to be this um, kind of old man in the sea type of man versus nature uh, uh, <laughs> built yeah, up that's, character. That's kind of what I was at, referring to getting to. But. At, at certain points it can be, and that can be compelling. But I think that the focus should be more so on, hey, wow, it's amazing what all these athletes can do and how uh, broad their capacities are. And then I think that the stories that should emerge should be their performances because they are the ones that are day in, day out, year in, year out, putting in the time. I mean, it's a pretty, I think it can be a pretty lonely thing to train seriously for any endeavor uh, and particularly for something that's as demanding as the CrossFit games. You, know, you got to honor the work that these athletes are putting in. And if they aren't allowed to shine as the focal points, um, that that's a real shame in my opinion. I love it. Absolutely love it. Boz. I'm so excited. We're what T minus less than what ten days. Oh man, Whoa, it's getting close. Man, I, I fly out. I fly out a week today. So okay, okay. Yeah. Well, listen. Thanks for taking the time and nerding out with me. I can't wait. To see The events on paper, and then more so, see the athletes take the ultimate test that you have planned for them come August. So thank you for taking the time. I can't wait to see what's up, and then I can't wait to do a little recap. And see if my bold predictions of what event may have been the one. <laughs> yes, I am looking forward to that conversation, yeah. too. It's going to be a blast. And um, to all the athletes and the fans out there, I sincerely hope you enjoy this year. Uh, I sincerely hope that you're inspired by it. And um, yeah, I just want to do right by the community and uh, everybody that supports it. So um, hope you guys enjoy. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Boz. And we'll see you guys in Madison.